This is the third video on the topic how do glasses work. In this video we're going to be looking at refraction, Snell's law and lenses. In this video we're going to be looking at refraction, Snell's law and lenses. So we're going to be considering what happens when light actually passes from one medium into another medium. When light moves from one medium to another medium, a few things can happen to it. One of these things is that it can be bent. And the amount it's bent can actually depend upon the colour of the light. So as we'll see in the next video when we look at colour in more detail, white light actually consists of light of all different colours, red, yellow, green, blue, etc. So when white light passes into a prism, the different colours are bent different amounts and this can result in a rainbow being formed. So this is actually why we see rainbows on rainy, sunny days. Different mediums have what's called different refractive indices. So the refractive index of a medium is given the symbol lowercase n, and it is equal to the speed of light in a vacuum over the speed of light in a medium. So different mediums slow light down different amounts, and the more, we'll see, the more the light slowed down, the more it bends in that medium. So the refractive indices of some common mediums are a vacuum has a refractive index of 1. Air is very similar to a vacuum, so its refractive index is almost 1 as well. Water has a refractive index of around about 1.33. Glass depends on the type of glass, but it's around about 1.5 and diamonds have a refractive index of 2.42, which is an especially high refractive index, and this actually results in diamonds being a lot more sparkly than glass and other things. So when light passes from a less optically dense medium, such as air, to a more optically dense medium, such as glass, water, or a vacuum, the light rays actually slow down. And this means that the crests in those light rays get closer and closer, and this results in the light ray actually bending. So let's have a look at Joe explaining this now. Why does light bend at the interface between media? This animation shows the crests of waves arriving in an interface, the direction of travel, which is the direction of the ray. At any point on the interface, the electric field oscillates at the frequency of the incident wave, so this must also be the frequency of the refracted wave. But if the speeds of light are different in the two media, then the wavelengths must be different. By substitution, the ratio of the wavelengths equals the ratio of the wave speeds. This will give us the law for refraction. Looking at these two triangles, we can relate the angles of incidence and refraction. Eliminating the distance d, we have sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 equals lambda 1 over lambda 2 equals c1 over c2. The ratio of the velocity of light in vacuum to that in the medium is, by definition, the refractive index of the medium. Substituting in our previous equation, we have sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 equals n2 over n1. This is called Snell's law of refraction. Let's test it experimentally with light. Here, a ray of light passes from glass into air. We measure the angle of incidence between the incident beam in the normal direction and the angle of refraction. We plot the sine of the angle in air against the sine of the angle in glass. Experimentally, we see they are proportional, and the ratio gives us the inverse ratio of the refractive indices. Further, to a reasonable approximation, the refractive index of air is 1, so this experiment gives us n for glass, or at least for this type of glass. This experiment also shows us that, as the angle of incidence increases, the reflected ray becomes stronger while the refracted ray becomes weaker and eventually disappears. More on that in the next section. Refraction in the atmosphere is responsible for mirages. In this example, the hot road produces a layer of hot, lower density air, which has a lower refractive index than the cooler air above. 
Some of the rays coming from the sky are bent so that we see the sky below the truck. In this photo, the sea and the air just above are warm, so we see the sky below the island. The island seems to be floating. So, as you've seen, when light goes from one medium to another medium, the frequency of the light doesn't change. However, lots of things do change. The light bends and so the angle changes. It can speed up or slow down, slow down if it's going into a more optically dense medium and so the speed changes and because of our wave equation that the speed is equal to the frequency times the wavelength, if the speed is changing and the frequency is staying the same, then we know that the wavelength has to change as well. So we have a very useful quantitative equation that describes the relationship between all these properties. It's called Snell's Law and can be written as N1 on N2, so that's referring to the refractive indices, is equal to sine theta 2 on sine theta 1. Now theta 1 and theta 2 here refer to the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction. And so the angle of incidence is theta 1 and it is measured as the angle between the normal to the surface and the light ray. The angle of refraction is theta 2 and it is equal to the angle between the normal to the surface and the direction the ray travels once it's entered the new medium. And so continuing with Snell's law, n1 on n2 is equal to sine theta 2 on sine theta 1 is equal to lambda 2 on lambda 1, where lambda here stands for the wavelength, and that is equal to v2 on v1, where v stands for the velocity in this case. So let's have a look now at how we can use Snell's law to solve a problem. So the problem is, light passes from air with a refractive index of 1.00 to water with a refractive index of 1.33. If the angle of incidence in air is 30 degrees and the wavelength of light in air is lambda is equal to 545 nanometers, calculate A, the angle of refraction, B, the wavelength of the light in water, and C, the speed of light in the water. Now the best thing to start doing in a question such as this is sketching a diagram so that we can clearly see what's going on. So we've got a boundary here. Up here we've got air. Down here we've got water. Let's sketch in our normal and now draw our light coming in. We've got an angle of 30 degrees and some other angle. So this angle here is 30 degrees, the angle of incidence, and this is the angle of refraction here. Now, we're going to need to use Snell's law in order to solve this. So we'll need to make use of the refractive index of air being 1.00 and the refractive index of water is 1.33. And Snell's law tells us that N1 on N2, so Na on Nw in this case, is equal to sine theta w, sine theta 2, over sine theta a. And so we can now substitute in. What we're trying to find out is this angle in water, the theta water. So let's just rearrange it before we substitute in. So we've got sine theta w is equal to Na on Nw times sine theta a. And now we can substitute in. Na is 1.00, Nw is 1.33, and sine theta, that's times sine 30. And so solving this one on the calculator, we can get 0 0.376. And then we just have to do the inverse sine on our calculator. So solving that on our calculator gives us theta w is equal to 22 degrees. And so we've now worked out the angle of refraction. Now next, we're asked to calculate the wavelength of the light in the water. So we need to find lambda in water. From Snell's law, we have that lambda on, in water over lambda on air is equal to n in, uh, n in air over n in water. And so lambda in water is equal to n air over n water times lambda air. And so this is equal to 1 over 1.33 
times 545 nanometers. And solving this one on the calculator, we end up with 410 nanometers. And we've given this one to two significant figures. Sorry, to three significant figures. Now part C, we're asked to find the speed of light in water. And so just again using the part of Snell's law, the speed in water over the speed in air is equal to the refractive index in air over the refractive index in water. And so we have that our speed in water is equal to Na over Nw times Va, which is equal to 1 over 1.33 times the speed in air. Now the speed of light in air is equal to the speed of light in a vacuum approximately, which is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And so this is equal to 2.26 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So still very fast, but not as fast as in air. And this is to three significant figures. Let's use Snell's law now to explain exactly why rainbows fall. So white light, such as the light that surrounds me, or as we'll see shortly, the light coming out of this light box, comprises of lots of different wavelengths of visible light. So in white light, we've got some red, which has a wavelength of about 700 nanometers, and some blue light with a wavelength of about 475 nanometers. Now glass actually has a diff slightly different refractive index for different colours. So for red light, the refractive index of glass is around about 1.513, whereas for blue light, the refractive index is around about 1.532. And so according to Snell's law, as we've got different refractive indices, we would expect these different colours of light to be bent a different amount. So because n1 on n2 is different, we would expect sine theta 2 on sine theta 1 to be different. So let's have a look now at what happens when we shine light from this light box through this prism and then look at the light coming out of the prism on the other side. In order to see it clearly, we're going to have to turn out the lights. So what we have here is a ray of light coming from the light box to the prism. You can see the ray of light here. The, inside the prism it is refracted and so it bends and the amount of bending depends on the colour of the light. And then it exits from the prism and you can see when it exits from the prism the light's been split into its different colours. So here we've got red light on this side and the blue or indigo light on this side. So let's have a look at some ray tracing now to show exactly why this happens using Snell's law. So what we have here is a diagram showing us a prism and the light ray coming in. So the light ray is making an angle of 45 degrees with the normal to this prism. And this glass prism has different refractive indexes for red light and blue light. So let's start by performing the calculation for the red light. From Snell's law, we know that sine theta r, which is the angle of refraction for the red light, is equal to the refractive index in air, which is medium 1, over the refractive index for red light in the glass, which is medium 2, times sine theta theta a. This is just an algebraic rearrangement of Snell's law. And now we can substitute in the numbers. We've got that the refractive index of air is 1. For glass with red light is 1.513. And the angle of incidence in the air is equal to sine 45. So this is equal to 0 0.467 which tells us that the angle of reflection for red light is equal to 27.86 degrees. So let's draw that now. Here's our red light and this angle in here is equal to 27.86 degrees. Now the light actually gets refracted twice 
because it gets refracted once again as it's leaving the prism. So let's draw the normal there. And now we'll need to do some simple geometry to work out the angles involved. Now because this normal forms a 90 degree angle, if this is 27.86 here, then here is 90 minus 27.86. So this angle in here is equal to 62.1. And now all the angles in the triangle have to add up to 180 degrees. So using this triangle here, we've got 60 plus 62.1 plus this angle is equal to 180. So we can solve that to get that the angle in here is equal to 57.9 degrees. And that angle, and so the angle of incidence when it's leaving the glass prism is this one here, and that will be 90 minus the 57.9, which is equal to 32.1. Okay, so now we can work out the angle as it leaves the prism. So we've now got that the angle in air for the red light is equal to the refractive index of the glass for red light over the refractive index of air times sine theta rr, let's call it. It's this 32.1. So substituting in, we've got 1.513 on 1 times sine of 32.1 and so this is equal to 0 0.804 and so theta AR is equal to 53.5 degrees. So let's sketch that red light leaving the prism now. So it forms a ray down here And this angle in here is equal to 53.5 degrees. Now what we need to do is repeat this process for the blue light. So we've got the sine theta r for the blue light. So this white beam consists of red and blue light. So it's got the same angle of incidence there is equal to Na over Ng for the blue light times sine theta a. And so this is equal to 1 over 1.532. So this is a refractive index for blue light times sine 45. And so this is giving us 0 0.462. And so theta is equal to 27.48 degrees. So here we had 27.86. This is a slightly smaller angle. So we can see that the blue light is going to go a bit more in this direction. We can then draw the normal here and then apply the same geometric process to work out what the angle is going to be. So this was 62.1 before. For the blue light it is equal to 62.52 and so this gives us an angle in here of 53.5 degrees, which means that this angle here is equal to 32.52 degrees. So this is the angle that we're going to have to use. So we've got that sine theta in the air for the blue light is equal to the refractive index for blue light over the refractive index for air times sine theta r blue air which is this 32.52 so this is equal to 1.532 over 1 times sine of 32.5 degrees and solving that we end up with this is equal to 0 0.8236 which gives us theta a for the blue light so the angle that it makes in air is 55 0.44 degrees and so it's going to come out at a slightly larger angle to the normal than the red light and so this is what gives us this rainbow effect in between the red and the blue we've got the orange yellow green etc 
So, so far we've been considering what happens when a light ray goes from a less dense medium such as air into a more dense medium such as glass. Let's consider now what happens when the light ray comes from the more dense medium and passes into that less dense medium. So let's consider what happens to the light ray travelling from glass with a refractive index of 1.5 into air with a refractive index of 1. Just substituting into Snell's law, n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2, we'll label the glass as medium 2, even though it's originating there, and the air as medium 1, we end up with sine theta 1 is equal to 1.5 sine theta 2. Now for small angles, where theta 2 is around about less than 30 degrees, say, this is easy to solve. You can just solve it in your calculator and get the angle of refraction as the light goes into the air from the glass. But when theta is equal to 42 degrees, something happens. At this point, when we do 1.5 times sine theta 2, we get 1. And so the angle of refraction is equal to 90 degrees. And so what happens then is as the beam comes out of the medium, it's refracted to such an extent that it actually travels along the boundary between the glass and the air. So this angle is called the critical angle. So all different mediums have different critical angles. The critical angle is given by 1 is equal to n sine theta times the critical angle. So what we have here is a light source and some fibre optic cables. Now these look, might look a bit familiar to you if you have Christmas decorations like this. So we can put these fibre optic cables on our light source and you can see the little pinpricks of light at the end of the fibre optic cables. So this is because most of the light travels all the length along the fibre optic cables as it can't escape because it hits the edges of the cable at an angle greater than the critical angle for the cable until it gets to the end at which point the light can move out of the cable. So this is how we send signals along fibre optic cables. Let's have a look at Joe discussing this now. Let's rewrite Snell's equation, setting n equals 1 for air, as in our previous experiment. n for glass is greater than 1, so for sufficiently large angle of incidence in glass, the angle of refraction in the air can have no solution. Sure enough, there is no refraction. Instead, we have total internal reflection. Total internal reflection in water gives rise to reflections that you might have noticed when you're swimming. Reflection, whether by mirror or by internal reflection, occurs in the same medium as the incident rays. So, using either symmetry or a geometrical argument like the previous one, the angles of incidence and reflection are equal. Total internal reflection explains the design of optical fibres. If the refractive indices of the fibre and its cladding were very different, propagating rays could have very different angles, and so would have very different path lengths. They would take different travel times, which would smear out the arrival of the ultra-short light pulses used for digital communication, and that would limit the rate of data transmission. So instead, we want theta critical to be close to 90 degrees, so that all transmitted rays have similar path lengths, therefore arrive nearly simultaneously. To achieve this, optical fibres are often clad with a material whose refractive index is slightly lower. Now that you've learned a bit about refraction, we can seriously start to consider how glasses work. Now glasses consist of lenses, so we're going to start by looking in detail at some different types of lenses. Now two common types of lenses are converging lenses and diverging lenses. Converging lenses bring light rays together, diverging lenses cause light rays to separate. And so there's three common types of converging lens. We've got the double convex lens, which has two convex surfaces, the 
plano convex lens, which has one surface as a plane and the other surface is convex, and the convex meniscus, which has a very curved convex lens and a slightly less curved concave side. So let's have a look now at what happens when we shine parallel light beams onto a converging lens. Now what we have here is a photograph taken from on top showing parallel rays emerging from a light box. This is the light box here. Now these rays come towards a converging lens at which point they are refracted and you can see that they all cross each other at a point here. Now this point here is called the focus and the distance between the focus and the lens, this length here, is called the focal length. So this image shows you what happens when parallel light rays enter the lens. Let's have a look now at some other situations using a converging lens. So what I have here is a large converging lens and on this sheet of paper I've drawn two little people one little person two little person and hopefully to you at the moment they look like they are about the same size now let's look at what happens when we put this converging lens between one of the little people and the camera and move it further move the lens further and further from the piece of paper can you see how that little person is getting bigger and bigger compared to the other little person. So this is because this acts as a magnifying glass. So let's do some ray tracing now to explain why the person gets bigger and bigger as we move the magnifying glass further and further away. Now in order to explain what happens with this magnifying glass, we're going to need to make use of these rules for ray tracing for lenses. So the rules are, number one, a ray coming from the top of the object traveling parallel to the axis is bent so that it passes through the focal point on the far side of the lens. Number two, a ray coming through the focal point on the near side emerges parallel to the axis. And number three, a ray coming through the center of the lens is undeviated and passes through the lens without being bent. So let's put these rules into practice now to show what happens with our magnifying glass. Okay, so here's our little man. Here's the camera or your eye which is looking through the magnifying glass at the little man. Now this is our converging lens and we've marked on the focal point on each side of this converging lens. So let's now apply rule number one. So a ray coming from the top of the object, so here it's coming off the little man's head, and traveling parallel, so there it is, traveling parallel to the axis, is bent so that it passes through the focal point on the far side of the lens. So in the middle of the lens, it's bent to go through this focal point like this. So there we go, that's ray number one. Let's just write a little one above it so that we remember. Now rule number two, a ray coming through the focal point on the near side emerges parallel to the axis. Okay, now the focal point is behind the little man in this case. So we need to draw a line coming from the focal point up across the top of the little man and to the middle of the lens like this. And it then emerges parallel to the axis. So we then know that it comes along here parallel to the axis. So let's label this as ray number two. And ray number three, a ray coming through the center of the lens is undeviated and passes through the lens without being bent. So it comes from the top of the little man's head through the very middle of the lens and is not bent. So it looks like this. 
Now you can see on this side of the lens where the eye or the camera is, all these rays are diverging. So what we're going to need to do now is trace them back to the point where they actually cross where the image will be formed. So let's do that now. We can do them in the inverse order. So we'll trace a long ray number three, trace it back. So the eye or the camera interprets it as originating it from this point as the eye doesn't realize what the lens is doing. Okay, now let's do ray number two. So the eye sees this ray is coming parallel to the axis from the lens and so imagines that it has always been traveling that way. And finally, ray number one is coming along this way. So if we trace it back, it goes through this point here. And so our brain interprets these three ways as all originating from this point. And so what we see is the top of the man's head formed here. We actually see the whole man here. So we interpret it as a large man formed behind the lens. And so this is a virtual image. The image isn't actually here because the rays never actually pass through this point. It's just that our brain interpreted the rays as coming from this point. So that is how a magnifying glass works and how we can apply those rules of ray tracing. Now, it's important when this acts as a magnifying glass that the little man is closer to the lens than the focal point is. If the little man moves back behind the focal point, then we're not going to get this magnifying magnification effect. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to work out what's going to happen. Now the other thing we observed was that as we moved this lens closer and closer to the eye or the camera, so the little man got closer and closer to the focal point, you can see that that's going to cause these rays to converge further and further back and so we're going to get more and more magnification of the image. Again, you may want to prove that to yourself by practicing the ray tracing in this case. Let's have a look at what else we can do now with a converging lens. So this is really exciting. You're going to see how old scale film projectors work. What we've got here is our double convex converging lens. Here we've got a light source and behind it there's a nice red power supply. Now, in a minute, we're going to turn out all the lights and we're going to look for the image of this light globe here. Now, in this case, we're looking for a real image. So we're looking for the point where these light rays actually converge and form that image. So let's turn out the lights now and try and find that image. Now, I'm using some white paper here as a screen. And what I'm going to do is slowly increase my distance away from the lens and the globe behind the lens. So as we go back, 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 you can start to see the red power supply on this piece of paper. Back, back, we can get it even more in focus. So there we go. Now here's, here's the light globe and here's the power supply. And you can hopefully see that the light globe is actually upside down. And this image is actually magnified. It's much bigger on this piece of paper than it is in real life. And so what we're getting here is a real upside down magnified image. And that is what they created in old fashioned film studios. They would project an image up onto the screen and they'd have to have the film upside down to start with in order to make it project the correct way up. So what we're going to do now is apply ray tracing to the light globe that we've just seen to see why the image appears the way it does. So once again, we'll just apply those three rules of ray tracing and see where the rays cross each other, which will tell us where the top point on the image actually is. So ray number one comes from the top of the image traveling parallel to the axis to the lens. Once it goes, gets to the lens, because it's a parallel ray, it travels through the focal point 
on the other side of the lens. So this is ray number one. So ray number two originates from the same place. It goes through the focal point on the near side of the lens and then when it has passed through the lens it emerges parallel to the axis. So we can see it emerging like this. This is ray number two. Now ray number three originates in the same place. It goes through the center of the lens and we can see it then emerges straight through the lens on the other side. It keeps going in the straight line. So we can see where these three rays cross and this is where the image is formed. Because the rays actually travel through this point, in this case it's going to be a real image. And what we end up with is an upside down image of our light on this side of the lens. And that is what we actually observed in the experiment. Now that we've had a nice look at converging lenses, we're going to have a look at diverging lenses. There's three common types of diverging lens. We've got the double concave lens, which has two concave surfaces. The plano concave lens, which has a concave surface and a surface which is just vertical, a plane. And concave meniscus, which has a very concave surface and a slightly convex surface on the other side. So let's have a look at some image formation with these lenses now. So what we have here is an image of parallel rays coming out of the light box. They're falling on the double concave diverging lens, at which point they're starting to diverge. So let's trace these rays backwards so that we can work out where the focal point is. So the focal point is back behind where they originate from, where these rays actually cross over. So you can see this point here is the focal point or the focus. And this length here between the focus and the lens is the focal length. for this diverging lens. So let's look at what happens now with the images coming from diverging lenses. So here we have a diverging lens in front of Little Man. As we pull the diverging lens closer to the camera, the Little Man shrinks. Let's look at ray tracing now to explain this. So here's our Little Man. Here's our diverging lens. We've marked on the focal points on either side of the lens and here's where the camera or the eye is positioned. Now we use a very similar technique of ray tracing to what we used before. So our first ray we draw from the top of our object parallel to the axis of the lens and now rather than passing through this focal point on this side, as this is a diverging lens it looks like the light is coming from here. So we do the light passing through the focal point on the near side of the lens, on the same side as the little man. So this is ray number one. Ray number two comes from the top of the man and it goes through the focal point on this side of the axis. However, it doesn't actually travel along this part of the path. When it hits the lens, it starts to move parallel to the principal axis like this. And finally, ray number three. Ray number three comes from the top of the man and it goes through the very center of the lens and then it keeps traveling in a straight line. So this is ray number three here. So you can see how we've had to change the rules slightly by changing the side of the focus that we were talking about in those rules. Now to work out where we see the image for this little man, what we have to do is trace these rays backwards because our eye doesn't take into account that they've been bent through the lens. 
So this ray 3 has already been traced backwards, as has ray 1. So let's just trace ray 2 backwards. So ray 2 is going parallel to the axis, like this. And so you can see that they meet up at this point here. And so that is the top of the man's head. And that is why the, little, the man appears more little. Now as we move this diverging lens closer and closer to the eye, I've left it as a task for you to show that the little man gets smaller and smaller. So optical instruments such as telescopes, microscopes and glasses or spectacles make use of lenses such as the ones that we've seen. So these can make images larger or smaller or they can project them in different places. So let's have a look at Joe discussing how some of these optical instruments work now. The simple microscope or magnifying glass is just a single converging lens used with the object a little closer than the focus. This produces a large, upright, virtual image. Magnification is greater than one and positive. With two lenses, we can, in principle, make a compound microscope, although modern microscopes are much more complicated than this. A refracting telescope also uses two lenses to produce a virtual image of distant objects. Dispersion in refraction causes problems for designers of optical instruments. For simple lenses, blue and red light have different focal lengths. The result is called chromatic aberration. Isaac Newton invented a telescope whose principal element was a large concave mirror. Its focal length depends only on geometry, so there is no chromatic aberration. Again, modern instruments are rather more complicated. Just for fun, let's do the analogy for sound. You're listening through this microphone at the focus of the parabolic dish, but I'm over here. The dish is focusing sound waves just the way a parabolic mirror focuses light. So now we've seen how lenses work, we can get a good idea about how spectacles work. So spectacles work by compensating for problems with our vision. So the optometrist tests our vision and works out if things aren't quite coming to focus in the correct place and then prescribes us glasses which compensate for our personal problems with eyesight. In the next video we're going to look in more detail at exactly how the human eye works and we're also going to look at colour vision which is a really fascinating topic. So special thanks to Sebastian Frick for filming this video. Anna Andreas Arreo took the photographs of the parallel light beams going through the diverging and converging lenses and she did this in Fen Fen Chang's lab so thanks very much to Fen Fen for allowing us to make use of his nice dark lab.